we went ahead and set up a company in the United States which would provide mathematical models for the stock market. So I kind of moved away from the aerospace except for the mathematics part. And I think that probably happened because I didn't have a big plan about my life. 2011, I came back to India to attend my sister's marriage. I hadn't been back to India for seven years, so my parents said, uh, would you like to stay there? And here I should mention my parents. The fundamental difference that they made in my life is they never asked me to get a job, they never asked me to keep a job. And these two things I think are a great blessing. Not everybody could have that kind of facility, but somehow that has made a difference. I got a head start because they never insisted that I particularly have to do something in life, get a job or make money. So that helped me say yes and no to a lot of things that others would have refused. So I was back in India and my mother asked me would you stay back for some more. I said, okay, I can work from home. That the internet connectivity was good, 2011. And I stuck around. And then I met Dr. Thomas Alexander one fine afternoon in May. I had never met him before. And he pitched to me whether I would like to take up and run an engineering college. And that for somebody who just came back from the United States and had been seeing how engineering education was happening in India, was a very golden opportunity. I did not know how risky it was going to be. I had no idea what I was taking on my head, but I said, yes, it would be interesting to see. I did not think he was serious. Fine. But next day he said, and you know what, we'll come to your home. Please go. There is this college called Trinity College of Engineering. Run it. So this was a tremendous day, May 28, 2012 when I got my own engineering college to run. At that time, the college was hardly a few months old, with 72 students. We had to get going. The labs were not set up. So parallelly, we had to run. But along the way, there were two things. His unstinting support. Nobody can walk differently unless there is a solid financial support coming from somewhere. Otherwise, that is going to be a constant worry. So the great thing about Trinity College of Engineering is that Dr. Thomas Alexander himself is an engineer. He's a civil engineer from Ramaya College, batch of 1982. So every time I tell him about a lab, about an exam, or about something that an engineering college needs, he understands. And therefore, it gets done. So that is one. The second thing, there is total control given. There was no question about why something should it be tried. Try everything differently. Because what was the difference we found? There was a simple mission statement that needed to be made about how to run an engineering college. I think we had around 112, 13 engineering colleges at that time, and then along with Trinity, jumped to 150. What would be the simplest way to run an engineering college? Engineering education is professional education, just like medical education. But look at the difference between medical colleges and engineering colleges. In Kerala also, we do not allot anybody a medical college unless you have a hospital. You should have a hospital with a certain number of beds, only then you get to run a medical college. Nobody in Trivandrum ever thinks of medical college Trivandrum as a college. We only think of it as a hospital. We think of it as a go-to hospital, but it's a college. So we started wondering, why are the engineering colleges like that? If we have an accident, we are referred to go to the medical college. If something breaks down the machinery in your house, nobody thinks of taking it to an engineering college. Why is that? Because in a medical college, you know that the best of the doctors, the best of the surgeons, are the people who are working and then teaching the next generation. This was very, very important. In engineering colleges, somehow we had managed to create a breed of people called engineering faculty who had nothing to do with engineering. In fact, there was a big percentage of them who got into teaching because they couldn't become good engineers. So that was the big difference. We wanted the best of the best to be training the next generation. In fact, that is the most successful model of education even in the Scandinavian countries. So at Trinity College, we decided we'll hire engineers and then train them to teach. So we went around looking for people who had the potential, who were fresh, and who could then do something of their own. So we would our simple mission statement was an engineering college like a medical college. If your pump breaks down at home, bring it to the college. We will have people who can fix it. 
if your cell phone is not working, the best of electronics engineers should be sitting in the electronics department. They are not mechanics or technicians, but they should be able to solve your problem. So with that vision, we started expanding the college, and that worked. And then we started thinking about quantity commission. The professor I mentioned, my PhD guy, Dr. Nathan Brady, on this. The man used to come to college in a Lamborghini Diablo. There are only 10,500 Lamborghini Diablos in the world, and one of them I have driven, and that was his. So how does a professor get to drive a Lamborghini and have a very flamboyant life? The reason was he had patents which were being manufactured by Aeroport Corporation. He was a man who was managing hundreds of thousands of dollars in funds, research funds, and doing projects that were real engineering. He was an entrepreneur. And so is the majority of the faculty members in the United States. MIT Media Labs is the hub from which almost everything comes out. Very recently we read that Yale University was beating IBM and Google black and blue when it comes to the uh, next state of quantum computing. How does a university? We went to USD Global, all the principals of engineering colleges were called. USD CEO Sajid Pune was there. And he was asking, look at the big difference in India and the United States. In the United States, all the companies, all the big multinationals are wondering what the big universities are doing. What are those labs doing? Where is the next breakthrough going to come that we have to adapt to? And look at the difference here. All the principals have come together and they are asking a multinational corporation, what should we teach so that you can take our students? So the cutting edge work never happens in colleges. We wanted to reverse that. And so we got to thinking, can we make faculty entrepreneurs? This is a more box, and one of the things I enjoy is taking long walks. I stay at where I am, but on Sundays I take a very long walk, reading all the flex boards and posters, all the way to Padmanabha Swami Temple, turn around at East Fort and then come back all the way to where I am. It takes around two hours. East Fort bus stand is a big problem for anybody from Javan. We keep changing the design, we keep adding ingredients and meridians and whatever can be done to solve that problem. Yet, nothing much happens, we still have practice. If you stand there and notice, the problem is, no matter how you build, how many lines you draw, unless the driver decides to come into the median and park, nothing can be done. Similar was the issue with entrepreneurship in the state. I met Dr. Casey C. Nair, who had set up the first technology business in Kuwait in Technopark, and who was a strong evangelist of entrepreneurship throughout the state. But then there was a problem in colleges. It was the same problem, just like the drivers. No matter what great ecosystem you create in a college, no matter how good an innovation and entrepreneurship development center you set up, unless the faculty, who is the last link, the person on whom the student community trusts, who controls their internal marks, etc., etc., unless that person is willing to encourage them, Unless he himself has experienced this, none of this was going to work. So we thought we have to empower the driver, train him, convince him to become an entrepreneur. So we started off with faculty entrepreneurship at Trinity College. And luckily, we had two great faculty who jumped at the opportunity. One was Jimmy Bendix, who runs uh, Clive HBAC right now. He started off as CNT Academy. Now it has become three companies actually in five years. We started off with one engineer sitting at Trinity College, now there are 12 sitting at Trinity and 5 in Karawa, Dubai. And the next time, who was in our computer science department, with IT markers that were incubated in Trinity and now works in Infopark, Kochi. So these two guys triggered something that affected the other faculty. Now what was the message? The message was very simple and I would like to give it to any faculty who is sitting here. As a faculty member, the college that you're working for guarantees you a salary for the courses that you teach. So you don't have to go home and explain things about there being an unsteady class flow. You will have your salary. So you are financially secure. Second, the colleges, especially engineering colleges, come set up with really good laboratories, which you can use. And thirdly, you have access to really superb human resource with all the enthusiasm that you're willing to work for free. 
When these three things are given, why wouldn't you start a company? Why wouldn't you be an entrepreneur? And luckily people listen. Today we have 12 companies at Trinity College of Engineering. Around 30, 35 faculty members are involved in this. And how has it changed? It's very difficult to change the syllabus. In our university system and affiliation system, it takes several years of Chaya and Mada before the small things get inserted into the syllabus. So forget about that. Teach the syllabus as it is because examination is important. This is an examination. In India, you are valued by whether you can clear an exam or not. That's not how it works in the entrepreneurial world or the business world. It's an experience, it's an experiment, it's not an exam. But that's not being taught. But after 3 o'clock in the evening, once the syllabus has been taught, the college has the freedom to offer short courses. And if the faculty is equipped, they are in the field, knowing the latest software and the hardware, knowing how things are going on in the world, they can flow those courses. And students will come flocking. At Trinity College, we have become a hub for doing projects for students from other colleges. At this very moment, as I speak, there are 16 students from IHRD College, Patanandita, who are undergoing a crash course in embedded systems. So doing is engineering, and that's very important. And a few months ago, we had a very lucky breakthrough that we got to collaborate with USD Global. Google Alex sitting here, he heads the innovation incubation ecosystem at USD Global. They came to Trinity College, and they realized that real engineering happens. And therefore, they have their automation garage set up in the college, immensely beneficial to students, because real-time engineering, we are helping them build the driverless car. And then on September 14th, we got to inaugurate the Turanum Technodots, which is an incubator system that is open to everybody. It's undertaken by the Kerala State IT Mission Department. So any of you who have any entrepreneurial plan, you're most welcome to come. We get to walk differently because there are people who influence us, ask us questions for which a or no answer would lead us either way. So we hope at college we manage an ecosystem that will help each of you walk very differently and help you be job creators and wealth creators and help our nation grow. Thank you very much for listening.